Good morning. Let's go ahead and stand for our first song. We have heard the joyful sound. <clears throat> we have heard the joyful sound. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Spread the tidings all around. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Bear the news to every land. Climb the steeps and cross the waves. Onward tis our Lord's command. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Wafted on the rolling tide. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Tell to sinners far and wide. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Sing the islands of the sea. Echo back. Well, we all lost an hour of sleep, but we're here. And uh, we've gained an hour at the end of each day uh, of sunshine, hopefully, for the spring, summer, and most of the fall. So we can rejoice that we're here. If you are visiting with us or watching online, we're delighted that you have joined us this morning. Thank you for coming our way. Um, we are delighted that you're here. We want to encourage everyone to come back if they can. Um, we have a little white card on the pew in front of you. For our visitors, if you would take one of those and please fill that out, we'd like to have a record of your attendance here this morning. We're, we're just delighted that you're here. Let's go ahead and pray as we start our service. Heavenly Father, thank you for the night of rest that you have given us. Thank you for this beautiful Lord's Day when we can come and worship you. We thank you so much, Father, for Jesus who died on the cross for our sins. And we pray our worship this morning uh, will be pleasing uh, to you. Father, thank you again for the many ways you have blessed us. Thank you for our ability to come together and enjoy fellowship with one another in this period of worship. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. There is a place of quiet rest near to the heart of God, a place where sin cannot molest, near to the heart of God, oh Jesus, blessed Redeemer, sent from the
God, our righteous and holy Father. Please be with this congregation, the elders, they oversee the work of the church and the deacons as they perform their duties. Be with those who teach classes, Heavenly Father, and be with Joe and our other ministers as they labor in this place. Heavenly Father, be with the Bates family as they have suffered loss. Be with those who are serving them. Go with us through this service now, Lord. Guide, guard, and direct us. Is our prayer in Christ's name? Amen. We'll be singing this next song to prepare our minds for the communion. <clears throat> we saw thee not when thou didst come to this poor world of sin and death, nor yet beheld thy cottage home. In that despise and Nazareth, but we believe thy footsteps trod in streets and plains, thou Son of God. But we believe thy footsteps trod in streets and plains, thou Son of God. We saw thee not when lifted high amid that. morning. As we prepare our minds for communion, hear the words Jesus spoke in Capernaum in John chapter 6, verses 53 to 58. Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood 
remains in me and I in him. Just as the living Father sent me, I live because of the Father. So the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your forefathers ate manna and died. But he who feeds on this bread will live forever. With those words in your heart and mind, let us pray. Lord, Heavenly Father, let us focus on the pure flesh this bread represents. Let it replace the sinful flesh we carry, and let it build your temple in our hearts for you to dwell. Amen. As the flesh built a temple in our hearts, the blood atones for our sin. Let us pray. Lord, thank you for your sacrifice for our lives. Thank you for the new covenant that came with your shed blood. Forgive us the sins and trespasses we commit and return us closer to you. Let us use the power and the might from your blood Make your kingdom better daily. Amen.
Jesus demonstrated that he was willing to give all for us on the cross. He only asked for our faith and love and for us to be disciples spreading his word. We have an opportunity now to demonstrate our love, our faith in his church, and to spread the word through our gifts. Let us pray. Lord, you've given us so much. Let us now honor you with our giving. And let those that use our gifts do so in a way that grows and blesses your church and brings more to your word daily. Amen. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, just to know the same. morning. I'll be reading from Colossians chapter 3 verses 8 through 10 verse 17 and chapter 4 verse 6. But now you must rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. All right. Kids already know what to do. Uh, if you're visiting and you've got kids that want to go next door for Bible hour, uh, we've got a program set up so you can get a little peace and quiet during the worship, uh, along with the rest of us. Uh, I've got a four and seven year old, if you don't know, so that might have been me talking to myself. <laughs> so, um, for those of you who know this song, uh, sing out because this is my first time leading it. And after uh, 
listening to the word uh, being read to us. I don't know why I didn't talk to Joe into letting me do uh, do all in the name of the Lord instead, because I do know that one. But <coughs> let's, uh, you're all standing, so let's sing. Holy words long preserved for our walk in this world. They resound with God's own heart. Oh, let the ancient words impart. Words of life, words of hope, give us strength, help us cope. In this world, where'er we roam, ancient words will guide us home. Ancient words ever true, changing me and changing you. We have come with open hearts, oh, let the ancient words impart. Holy words of our faith handed down to this age, came to us through sacrifice, oh, heed the ancient words of Christ. Holy words. Long preserved for our walk in this world, they resound with God's own heart. Oh, let the ancient words impart ancient words ever true, changing me and changing you. We have come with God's own heart. Oh, let the ancient words impart. We have come with open hearts. Oh, let the ancient words impart. Please be seated. Good morning, and welcome to each and every one of you this morning uh, in any forum uh, from which you're joining us. We welcome you, and uh, this this room seems to be getting fuller and fuller uh, every Sunday, uh, and that's great. Um, we have a lot of people checking us out. We hope that you can find uh, in us a church home, uh, that you'll strongly consider us if you are if you are in the looking stages for uh, a church home. We'd love to be uh, that place. So, Travis, now you tell me. Uh, you mentioned one that I hadn't even thought about, but that, that would have been a good one too. But uh, he, uh, he uh, learned that song this week, but you wouldn't have known that. You wouldn't have known that was his first time to lead that song. Uh, he led it like he's been leading it for years. So, appreciate it very much. Um, so, one more thing I'll add before getting into the message. Did you notice the opening screen this morning? The welcome? That was, that was on purpose. Uh, if you don't know uh, Jim Bates, uh, who we lost this last week, a uh, dear friend to this church, to the church, period, um, his catchphrase in later years was, when he'd get up to speak, have I told you lately? that I love you, and uh, I'm going to miss that. I already do miss that, as I miss him, and um, his family's here today, and they're in our prayers and uh, in, our, in our thoughts, and uh, continue to lift them up this week, and as we'll have a chance to honor uh, him and his life and his memory this Saturday at 10 in Colleen, and we'll say more about that as the week goes along. So, what I wanted to do this morning is pick up where we left off last week. In case you were not with us last time, it was with a challenge to remember that we make our speech just as gracious as the speech for which Jesus was commended. You remember last time they were amazed, the text said out of Luke 4, at the gracious words that came out of his mouth. Would that people would look at us and listen to us in Christ and be amazed by the gracious words they hear 
coming from the lips of Christians. Amen? That's, that's the challenge that we uh, issue here. The other commendation for Jesus' speech, besides the one from last week out of Luke 4, comes from the incident in Matthew 22 that I discussed in a sermon back on February 5th. I know you remember it perfectly well, but that one was called uh, What the World Needs Now is Truth, in which the authorities said, and it's the only time that they commended Jesus for anything, they said this, his speech or anything else. Uh, they said, Teacher, we know you're a man of integrity and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. Great words, if only they had lived what they said in those words. Because if you remember, in the very moment of uttering those words, they were trying to trap him. They were being disingenuous with Jesus, even in the moment of complimenting him for his, his genuineness. So it's a dawning challenge that's held up before us, which is that in all things, Jesus spoke well. He was intentional with every word he said. Uh, his words were intended to provoke and convict and embolden and give hope and give life and build up, always appropriate. And he never said anything that didn't need saying. And often, here's the other side of the coin, his reserve in not speaking is just as notable as what he actually said. Which leads to the soft challenge that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw out here. By the way, I love this Arab, uh, Arabic proverb. Open your mouth only if what you're going to say is more beautiful than silence. Isn't that great? That's a good thought to plant in your, in your mind this week. That's, that's convicting there. Uh, but here's the soft challenge I want to throw out to you. Raise your hands if, now hold on a second, raise your hands if you, as opposed to what we just said of Jesus, ever said or sent by a text, email, Twitter, Facebook, whatever else is out there. In other words, if you've uh, communicated by any means something which you came to regret, raise your hands. I better see every hand go up. Okay. Now, usually the regret comes immediately as you push that button or you say that word or whatever, but it will come sooner or later, if not immediately. Welcome to the human race, right? Now, I just give you pass for just a second. It's, it's part of the human uh, predicament, blame it on Adam, because we all come by it honestly, right? And along the way, others have committed the same foot and mouth disease uh, as we and could readily commiserate with us. Peter comes to mind, for one, among many other notables, I'm sure. Sometimes I'm pretty sure Paul committed the same thing as well. In other words, there's no notable that hasn't committed this same thing as well. But remember that James, the Lord's brother, said in that long bit about the power of words in chapter 3 of his letter. If anyone is never at fault in what he says, he is a perfect man or, or woman, able to keep his whole body in check. I think he's saying there that a big part of self-control for the Christian starts with controlling what we say. And I cannot help but believe that Jesus, uh, James rather, was totally aware of what I read you last week out of Matthew 12, 36 about our being accountable in judgment for every careless word. You have to believe that James was aware of that when he warned at the start of chapter 3, not many of you should presume to be teachers because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. He knew and he was convicted of the fact, whether it was from hearing his brother Jesus say it and his Lord and Master say it or not, but I figure he did, he was convicted that words are a serious matter. Words do matter. As we said last week, they can build up or they can destroy. And James would go on to tell about the seeming contradiction there. That we can be with the same tongue building someone up 
one minute and tearing them down the next. And noting that contradiction, he says, with the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men who've been made in God's image. My brothers, this should not be. To that we all say amen, right? It should not be. Author uh, Emerson Egrix came on to a story in a collection of them called The Children's Story Garden. This is from 1920. And he basically extended this, took this story and he extended it into a, a, a book of his own called Before You Hit Send. It's a, it's a good one. I have it in my uh, library. And, of course, he's talking about the, the title implies you know, electronic media today, but you can just as easily apply it to before you speak. You, you can just as easily. The principle is, is that he's after in that book is, is the same across the board. Before you communicate, stop and think. Um, and as the subtitle says there, I can't read it on the back screen, but Preventing Headache and Heartache is his subtitle there. But the story that he found is called The Three Sieves. I, I guess I'm saying that right. We don't use that word sieve, something you sift something with every day, uh, but hopefully you'll recognize it in the context here. Little boy comes home from school one day to tell his mom, Oh, mother, what do you think of Tom Jones? I've just heard that. And her mom says, wait a minute, wait a minute. Have you put what you've heard through the three sieves before you tell it to me? Sieves? Mother, what, what's that? What do you mean? And she says, well, the first sieve is called truth. Is it true? Here's the three and he says, well, I don't really know, but Bob Brown said that Charlie told him that Tom, oh, oh, wait just a minute. That's awfully roundabout. So I think, I think that first one is in doubt. What about the second sieve, kindness? Is it, is it kind? Kind? No. I can't say it's very kind. Now, the third sieve is necessity. Will it go through that one? Must you tell this tale? No, mother. I need not repeat it. These are pretty well backed up by Scripture. And so I thought it would be a good idea this morning to borrow these ideas from Egrich, which he borrowed from this story of long ago, to help us figure out appropriate and timely speech from that which is not. Except I prefer to use the word sifter. I know what a sifter is, okay? I remember many a time my mom had this ancient tool. Now that may not be the right word, but that's my word for it, with which she would sift her flour out. I think we still, do we have that? We still have that at the house. So, Oh, you have one too. I was talking about my my mother's. Uh, we, we still have it. Um, so, that's what I want to talk about, the three sifters for just a moment. And look at some of the, uh, you'll hear particularly some of the Proverbs. But as we think about this, are they truthful? Are our words kind? And maybe most importantly, do they really need to be said at all? Are they necessary? Um, as you may know, the Proverbs says a lot on that third one. is discretion and discernment on timing is one of the better parts of wisdom. So, to start off with, truthful words. Why, why would anyone want to tell a lie in the first place? I love what Egrich said a, a friend once told him. And he asked him a question and they immediately gave him the answer. He said, you know the meaning of rationalize? And he answered it, rational lies. Think about that. Meaning that, yeah, we all have our reasons, right? Although the truth of the matter is, especially for one in Christ, there is no real good reason to ever tell a lie. There are excuses. We can come up with a lot of excuses, but no real good reasons 
to tell an untruth. Well, excuses though abound, whether because it's one uh, someone is afraid, maybe of being hurt by someone or losing a job or relationship when they think lying will make it more more secure, or when someone's pumping themselves up by boasting perhaps or making themselves feel better by gossiping, or trying to kiss up to someone and gain influence with them by false flattery. And on and on we could go. You notice you notice they're the lowest common denominator? They're all self-centered. Every rationale uh, uh, that you can give for lying, for not telling the truth, is self-centered. Self-protection. Self-preservation. It's all about what's best in the moment, for me. Of course, the primary reason for telling truth is named by Paul in his letters to both Ephesians and Colossians. Speak truth with your neighbor, for we are members of one another, he says in Ephesians 4. And in the end of the Colossians, do not lie to one another since you laid aside your old self with its evil practices. He said, untruth was then, before Jesus. Now in your life in Jesus, you're to tell the truth. It's that simple. Here's some warnings from the Proverbs. Again, reason enough to be truthful and genuine in all that we say. The Lord detests lying lips, but He delights in men who are truthful. That's Proverbs 12. In Proverbs 19, we read these words, a false witness will not go unpunished, and he who pours out lies will perish. In Proverbs 26, a lying tongue hates those it hurts, and a flattering mouth works ruin. And then from Proverbs 11, a gossip betrays a confidence, but a trustworthy man keeps a secret. So that's the first sifter that we need to apply to our words before we speak. Let's consider the second one for a moment. Is there kindness in the things we say? Kindness to everyone, not just to our favorites. We say, well, we're always kind to those we, you know, that we love, that we're close to. Is that engaged with everybody? It ought to be for one in Christ. Ephesians 4.15 brings up a problem, and I'll mention it briefly here. But speaking the truth in love, we're to grow up in all aspects into Him who is the head, even Christ. We can be just as truthful as the day is long. But if we speak the complete truth in an unkind or hurtful way, what have we gained? We have failed the challenge of my title today, which is say it well or don't speak at all. We have failed. But but it's the truth. But it's offered in a way that kills, that hurts. That takes away from the value of it. If only some people I've known who feel like embracing the truth means they can beat someone over the head with it and wrongly that they will win someone over that way, would hear and really heed what Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy 2. With gentleness, correcting those who are in opposition, if perhaps God may grant them repentance, leading to the knowledge of the truth. It will not happen if you beat someone over the head with truth. Those who speak it without kindness or gentleness, who do so in the name of dispensing what they call sound doctrine, they are going to have a rude awakening at the judgment. I can assure you that. I know some personally who have to answer for turning people away from truth and losing people for the Lord. Because that's what dispensing truth without kindness and respect does. That's exactly what happens. It turns people off like a switch. 
The author of the book I've been referencing here once heard someone put it this way, when I know you hate me, I cannot hear you. Think about that. Ears are tuned out if there's no love or gentleness or respect. What would we expect? I know you feel the same way as I do. I'm, no one's going to get a hearing from me if they approach me with unkindness. That's just that's human nature. Instead, as Paul tells the Colossians, and you heard this in the reading a moment ago, let your speech always be full of grace. There's Jesus again. Let it be full of grace seasoned with salt so you may know how to respond to any person. Let the speech be winsome. You've heard that expression, right? Let it be winsome so we may win some. It won't happen any other way. Again, from the Proverbs, there's one who speaks rashly like the thrust of a sword, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. So the second sifter to remember is kindness. And then last, certainly not least, is the sifter of our speech which asks, do we really need to say it anyway? Does it really need to be said? Is it necessary? Back to James, the Lord's brother, who I've referenced several times here, he very pointedly speaks to unnecessary verbiage when he said everyone should be quick to hear or listen, depending on your translation, slow to speak. Yeah, that's the Joe version. The personal emphasis there. It's the old... You've got two ears and only one mouth for a reason. Exhortation, right? There's a reason why God does everything. There's a reason why He makes us the way He makes us. So don't have that truth be lost on you, but keep it in mind before you say a lot of things that aren't necessary. How about these sharp reminders from the Proverbs and some from the preacher of Ecclesiastes? You see a man who's hasty in his words, there's more hope for a fool than for him. That's Proverbs 29. The more words, the less the meaning. And how does that profit anyone? Ecclesiastes 6. When there are many words, transgression is unavoidable. But he who restrains his lips is wise. Proverbs 10. Just a few more on heavy note here. A man has joy and an apt answer. And how delightful is a timely answer word that's from Proverbs 15 the one who guards his mouth preserves his life the one who opens wide his lips comes to ruin Proverbs 13 he who guards his mouth and his tongue guards his soul from troubles that's pretty huge that's Proverbs 21 and lastly this is one of my all time favorites on this Even a fool, when he keeps silent, is considered wise. When he closes his lips, he is considered prudent. Isn't that great? Sometimes even fools can be wise people. Well, let's sum it up by saying if the timing is inappropriate, or the tone, or if it's communications that's not clear, or if it seems wrong for any reason, Certainly, if it seems unbecoming of Jesus and His gracious way of speaking, then it's better left unsaid. The preacher of Ecclesiastes puts a very sobering capper on this one in chapter 5. Don't be quick with your mouth. Don't be hasty in your heart to utter anything before God. God is in heaven and you are on earth, so let your words be few. We've got to be constantly aware. God sees at all times. He hears at all times. What's even more frightening is He knows our words when they're just unformed thoughts.
let's consider that with all seriousness. As Christians, God expects our lips to be consumed with praising Him and bringing Him honor more than they are with anything else. And we especially honor Him when we honor each other and make it a point to bless one another with our words. So I'd urge you, let's rise up to the challenge of our speech like Jesus issued in Himself, because really He did. Let's think it through and say it well, or else let's just not speak it at all. That's the message, that's the invitation for us to live more closely each day in this particular way like Jesus and draw more people to want to know Him. Let's stand and sing. Let the beauty of Jesus be seen in me All His wonderful, passionate pure. Thank you so much, Joe, for those words. I, I doubt there's anyone here today that, that can't make good application. It's my honor today to also welcome those of you that are visiting with us. We're honored that you chose to be with us, and we hope you'll come back every chance you get. We've got two rows of Parks family folks over here, and uh, that's a, a great birthday for Travis. We. Wish you a happy birthday and hope you enjoy all that large family that's here. Glad you're feeding them and not me. <laughs> uh, if the uh, folks who served this morning will make your way back up here. As they're coming up, I just wanted to let you know that we've been working on this year's budget uh, it's been, sort of been like whack-a-mole. Every time we think we've got it, something else pops up. But we think we're, we're there. Uh, you'll be getting an email this week with uh, the budget in there, and we hope you'll consider that prayerfully. And uh, if the Lord has blessed you abundantly to respond accordingly in your giving, uh, that'll be coming out. And if you have any questions, just uh, speak with one of the shepherds and we'll be glad to discuss it with you. And we appreciate your kind attention to that this week. Last week, uh, Joe Ritchie spoke to us about the need of the Christians in Ukraine. We've responded once earlier and we're aware that the need is still there. Christians have been displaced. They've uh, those that are still in place have lost their power, uh, their heating, the things that we take for granted. They're struggling, and we have an opportunity to help. We had mentioned last week that we're going to have a special contribution today. And as we do that, consider the needs of these Christians in Ukraine. The funds that we collect will be sent to the church in College Station, 
they will relay those funds. They have a route to send those where they'll be used for necessities such as mentioned earlier for propane, for batteries, for uh, Starlink internet service where they can communicate with one another. Would you be considering that now as we have a word of prayer? Father, as we gather this morning, we look about us and we see how blessed and prosperous we are. We see the safety that we have as we gather together. And Father, we pray Your forgiveness as we take for granted all the good things You bless us with. Father, this morning help us to be mindful of our fellow Christians who are in need. Father, we pray that these gifts that are given will bless them, will strengthen them, gird them up for the daily challenges that they face. Father, bless them, give them peace. We pray that uh, peace might abound in Ukraine. Father, give them peace of mind, give them comfort. Help them to maintain their hope. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. wanted to make sure Alvin was done. Uh, let's go ahead and sing. Uh, once again, uh, stand and sing. Uh, once again, it's always good to see y'all. Um, thanks for the birthday wishes and for what it's worth, I did not know I was cooking for them. So, <laughs> so now I've got to come up with a plan. <clears throat> Though the way we journey may be up and drear, we shall see the King someday. Blessed morning, clouds will disappear. We shall see the King someday. We shall see the King someday. We will shout and sing someday. Gather round the throne when He shall call His own. We shall see the King someday. Someday, after strife is over, after set of sun, we shall see the king someday. We shall see the king someday. We will shout and sing someday. Gathered round the throne when he shall come. Good week. Me too.